This is EM Pulse with your hosts, Julia Magana and Sarah Medeiros. You had me at hello. I really had my heart set on going to a particular place and a particular job, and it just never occurred to me that that wasn't going to work out. And then there were a couple of roadblocks that were put up, and I wasn't offered that job. And I also was not offered a job at my home institution. And so I was really struggling, I would say, personally and professionally at the moment when I accepted my first job. But I had a very good friend who was in a different location. She was finishing her fellowship there. And she said, why don't you come here and look? So I did. And I liked it there. When I went there and I looked at the job that they were offering, they said, hey, here's our base salary. This is what we give everybody. I just accepted them at their word. It didn't occur to me to say, well, maybe this is your base salary, but... What are the bonuses? What are the perks? What are the moving expenses? How about a sign-on? And when I came back and I talked to the people who had mentored me during this time, my fellowship director, my division director, should have been a clue to me that they hadn't offered me a job at my home institution, right? That maybe they weren't looking out for my best interests at that point. They said, you take what you get. And then once you get there, you work as hard as you possibly can. And then you prove yourself. And then maybe they'll offer you some other stuff. So I went and I talked to the hospital lawyer. I took the contract they gave me and I gave me and I went and I talked to the hospital lawyer and they said, oh, this is all very boilerplate. And so I think that they don't really want you to question it because they want everybody to take the same thing. They don't want people to start questioning things. They don't want people to start asking for new things. They don't want people to start arguing about things. They want people to accept that what you're given is a boilerplate and that you sign the boilerplate contract that you're given. When I look back now, I wish that I had asked more questions, that I had negotiated time, for example. Welcome back to Impulse. Today's episode is all about negotiations in emergency medicine, with an emphasis on women. That's right, Julia. So negotiating for what you need and want is an essential skill for any emergency medicine physician. But for women, the challenges and barriers can be even greater. Uh, Yes, we definitely know that. (laughs) (laughs) And that's why we've teamed up with the women in PEM from the section of emergency medicine of the AAP to bring you this episode. In fact, the story you heard at the beginning was Dr. Selena Harry Heron, Women in PEM co-chair and professor of pediatrics division of PEM at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. You know, Sarah, I typically think about negotiation as a key skill when I'm starting a new position or something big. But as I've been preparing for this podcast, I realize that we use these skills all the time. You know, I was just in a meeting with another service to talk about running codes in the emergency department. And let me tell you, that meeting went less than ideal. (laughs) I could definitely use some negotiating skills for round two. Yeah, I hear you on that. And while this podcast is specifically about the big negotiation moments, the principles can be applied to many moments. To walk us through negotiations, we have Dr. Cherry Hobgood. She is the founder of the Center for Leadership Life and an expert in negotiations. Dr. Hobgood has years of experience advising and training emergency medicine physicians on how to negotiate effectively, especially in challenging situations. So whether you're a seasoned emergency medicine physician or just starting out, this episode is for you. We'll be discussing strategies for negotiating in emergency medicine and exploring some of the unique challenges that women, heck, we all face in our field. What is negotiation? Like, what does this mean in the context of emergency medicine? Well, you know, the formal definition is that it's a process, right, that takes place when two people get together to identify their independent needs and goals and try and figure out if there's some common ground. I like to think about as a relationship building exercise, because a negotiation really is exactly that. If you are going into a new role, a new job, a new leadership position, it really doesn't matter what, you're working with that person in building a relationship that you hope is going to carry forward. And so that 
ability to be reasonable, to have mutual concessions, and to gain clarity about what each of you think is important in that particular space that you're talking about is essential. So that's really what a negotiation is. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to like the person, but what it does mean is that you have to believe that person to be an honest broker and that you gain the type of clarity that you need in order to be successful in that new space and place. Now, it feels to me like this may be different for women, for example, compared to men. Is there data there? There's a ton of data, actually. You know, the classic is, you know, the book that says women don't ask, right? And so, but in reality, that's not actually true. The truth is women don't ask for themselves. Women ask on behalf of others. Women ask on behalf of what they believe the greater good. Women ask on behalf of what they think they need in order to make their family life successful. And they're willing to take personal concessions in order to achieve those other higher level goals. The trick in all this is constructing an internal mental model that allows you to recognize that when you're negotiating for all those other things, whether that be for the greater good of your family or the group, that you're also negotiating for yourself. And that if you are not successful in achieving what you personally need, you're going to be tired, exhausted, frustrated, and unhappy. And therefore, the negotiation ultimately was not a success. And so you really need to think about that and, again, flip it a little bit, change the mental model, and realize that getting what you need and want is just as important as getting what everybody else needs, and that you shouldn't be ashamed to ask for it. When we talk about negotiations, what do people typically think of? People typically think of this win-lose scenario where someone wins and someone loses. And again, I want to flip that framework because I think the real way to think about negotiation is figuring out what everybody needs in order to win. And this is, again, a particular skill that women are very, very good at. Women are very insightful and very thoughtful and are able to construct solutions that work for everybody. We do it all the time, right? And so thinking about a negotiation like that, again, is a different type of framework that allows you to be more successful. Figuring out what the other person needs in order to be successful in their role actually gives you a tremendous amount of power because you can then identify and knowing a priori, hopefully, what you need in that role allows you to then marry those two things together and create a more creative solution increasing the size of the pie as opposed to shrinking it. So can you walk us through this a little bit? What are the elements of a good negotiation? Well, there are lots of different parts of a negotiation, and you can, you know, create a nomenclature or name anything. But the first part, I think, is really figuring out what are the interests? What do people actually want? And then the next thing is thinking about what are your options? Then What are the sources that you can utilize within that space? What, again, is negotiable? What isn't negotiable? And then from those two things, and hopefully knowing a little bit a priori again, before you come into the negotiation, what's your bat now, right? Batman? (laughs) No, Sarah, BATNA. BATNA stands for the best alternative to a negotiated agreement. In negotiation discussions, it refers to the best course of action that a party can take if they're unable to reach an agreement with that other party. It represents the alternative to the current negotiation and provides a standard against which the current offer can be measured. So knowing your BATNA is important because it gives you leverage in the negotiation. If you have a strong alternative to the current negotiation, you may be more willing to walk away from the table if the other party is not willing to meet your needs. On the other hand, if your BATNA is weak, you may feel more pressured to agree to terms that are not in your best interest. In short, BATNA is a crucial concept to a negotiation because it helps parties determine whether or not to accept an offer and under what conditions they're willing to make a deal. What are your alternatives? What's your best alternative to a negotiated agreement? What am I going to do if we don't agree? What other things can you bring in to help change that structure? But the most important part about understanding that best alternative to a negotiated agreement is working that out beforehand. Understanding, do you have another job offer on the table? What are the constraints of that particular role? And then 
weighting that in your mind. If you want to live in a particular place and only one place will do, then you lose a fair amount of power in a negotiation, right? If you have multiple places that you can live and that your family would be happy and that you would be happy, then you gain a lot more flexibility and that gives you many, many more options. So thinking about those things and weighting them is particularly important before you go into sit down and have the first conversation. And notice that I said the first conversation because a negotiation, again, is a process. And one of the pitfalls of a negotiation is thinking that you have to do it all in one sitting. You don't. And so that's particularly important to keep in mind. Another element of negotiation is the legitimacy. Asking yourself, is what I just heard true? And having an understanding of the framework of either the institution, the space in which you're working, is that correct? For example, people always talk about salaries, right? We want to understand about salaries. Most institutions use benchmarks for salaries. The real question in the negotiation is not what's the salary. The question is what's the benchmark? Because once you can figure out the benchmark, then you can have an external validation of whether the information that you learned was true. And that's particularly important as you're gaining trust with the individual that you're speaking with. And it's particularly important for you because those benchmarks change over time. And so understanding that is very important. And then the relationship is another issue. And it's a common pitfall and a pitfall for women because women have a difficult time separating the relationship from the issue. And when we think about the issues that we're talking about, that's the actual factor. The relationship stands independent, and you have to understand and manage that differentially. But when you get all bound up in an emotional response to an issue, again, you lose power. You're talking about an issue. It carries independently no emotion, and it does not reflect whether or not the person likes you, wants you to be in the job, etc., All it is, is an issue. And that may be something that that person has little to no control over. And then the communication. Are you actually listening? Are you hearing what they're saying? Are you taking in all the data that that person is putting out at that particular moment in time? And then commitments. Commitments are great, but if they're not implementable, if you can't actually do the things that you know, you've either agreed to or they can't do the things that they've agreed to, then the commitment is essentially useless. So that gets to people speaking outside their actual scope of authority. And so you really do need to understand what is the range of this person's authority and can they actually agree to that? Circling back around to the legitimacy issue. Is that true? Can you do that? Et cetera. As somebody who wants to believe the best in people all the time, I have to say, I'm like, my eyes are wide as you're saying that. Like, somebody would lie to me in the middle of a negotiation? I cannot imagine this. They may not even think that they're lying. They may just not be able to execute on a particular commitment. Or they may give you, for example, the low range of a scale, depending upon what kind of variable, I guess, would be used for a particular benchmark. They may give you the low range. I had a negotiation once with a dean and I knew what the benchmarks were. I knew that I wanted the median. He wanted me to take the mean. And I kept going, you know, no, I want the median. And he's like, no, uh, we should take the mean. We always use the mean. Actually, he said, typically we use the mean. Typically means that there's other options in there. So what benchmarks are we talking about? Where can people go to find that salary data? What's the best source? Most people will benchmark according to the AAMC in academic medicine. It just depends. And so the AAMC benchmarks are available. You can buy them for a price or you can work with a coach or someone who has access to the set of benchmarks. Or you can actually ask your faculty development office. Most of the time, the faculty development office will go in and just do a screenshot of a particular page for you. There's a little bit of additional data you need to know and understand when you're using a double AMC benchmark. One of those is, are you using a regional benchmark or using a national benchmark? And then how does your institution consider your tiers of rank? And so understanding that 
is important because it gives you definitely discrete additional data. So that's useful. Some of the other benchmarks that people use are MGMA benchmark. That's a blended benchmark from a, both a community and a private practice setting and an academic benchmark. So it works in spaces and places that have dual types of employments where some of the time you might be working in a community setting or some of the time you might be working in an academic setting. And they'll use these blended benchmarks. The most important thing is just figuring out what benchmark they actually use. Things like MGMA benchmarks, much harder to get. AMC benchmarks, much easier to access but knowing what they're using and then asking, you can always ask, can I see the benchmark? And so things like MGMA benchmarks are tiered by size of group. You're seeing 100,000 patient visits a year in your ED or you're seeing 20,000 patient visits a year. Is it a pediatric benchmark or is it an adult benchmark? Is it a blended pediatric and adult benchmark? Those are all things that can get you to the numbers. But the most important thing around that is knowing what they're using because those things evolve over time. And if you are using a benchmark to set your salary, then your salary should evolve over time with the benchmark. That doesn't mean it always goes up, but it is something to consider in the conversation. And you need to understand how they use the benchmark, how often the benchmark's applied, and then does that again. Change if it substantially moves to the negative side of the coin, in particular for the physician. All right. So as we look at points for negotiations that, you know, obviously start of career, start of a new job, moving into positions, there's lots of points of negotiation during a career lifetime. When does that actual negotiation start? What did they say in Jerry Maguire? You had me at hello, <laughs> right? It's hello. That's when the negotiation starts. I mean, that's a bit of a trite answer, but the reality is that's very true. When you begin to speak to someone about a role, their impression of you is being formed. And it is that impression of you that they will use to determine how much flexibility they want to give in this conversation. They can be absolutely rigid and say, nope, the only thing that I can do is stick with this contract and that's it. That's all I've got. Or they can create some options for mutual gain, as they say, so that you can build in other things that you might be able to acquire, if you will, as part of that discussion and dialogue. You've given us some of this already in terms of salaries, but what steps should physicians take to prepare when they're applying for a new job or a potential change in contract? I think the first thing that they should do is gain information. You know, you really need to ask and get as best you can clear answers about what's the environment like? How are people paid? Do people feel they're being treated fairly? What is the rate of pay? It used to be that people wouldn't talk at all about how much they were getting paid. And now people seem to be much more willing to talk about that. So I say ask and hopefully you'll Get some answers that would be helpful to you as you prepare for an ongoing discussion. What's the person like that you're going to be talking to? You know, if you have friends in the environment, ask them, what's this person like? You know, what's this chair like? What's this group leader like? Does he or she have a reputation for treating people fairly? Are they scary, threatening? Should you be prepared for that? Because you you can always rehearse. You can get the scariest person you know to rehearse this negotiation or conversation with you, and that'll take some of that fear out of your demeanor, if you will, as you move into the conversation. So gaining information is, I think, the very first and probably the most important thing that you need to do. And when I say gaining information, I don't necessarily mean to think that the only information that you're going to gain is on the other side. I think being truly introspective and knowing exactly what you need, why you need it, and when you need it is particularly important. And if you can understand those steps, then you gain internal flexibility that you can then use to construct your, quote, BATNA, if you will. If you know that you want to work in a particular academic environment and you know that you need to be in the region, so you've already lost a lot of flexibility, but what do you need in terms of your career path? What's coming up for you in terms of life events in year one, year two, year three, year four? 
What do you need in order to build your career successfully? And when I say that, I'm not talking about things like protected time. I mean, I am. Those are definitely things that should be on the list. But there's a lot of other things that are going to make you happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise, and that you need to begin to think about what those things are for you individually. Do you need additional training, CME dollars that would extend above the amount that might be typically offered? Do you need flexibility, in particular types of flexibility? What type of flexibility do you need? Do you need to be able to pick up your kids from school because of you know, your partner's work schedule or because you simply want to? Do you need to be able to shift your allocation of time from month to month? In other words, one month I want to work 20 shifts, but the next two months I only want to work 10. Those are the kinds of things that you can build into your own list of needs and wants. And having real clarity around that gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility, again, to create those options for mutual gain so that you can construct a solution that's actually functional for you. And that doesn't mean that it always has to be the solution. So for example, oftentimes you might be entering into a job negotiation with a chair that just say that they're particularly short right now and they need to get some people on board and they might have somebody going out for maternity leave. And so they really need you to start in July. You really wanted to start in August or September because you wanted a couple of months off, but you're interested in staying in the particular place. So you have that little bit of data about what their needs are. But you also know that you just say you want to get pregnant in the next however period of time, or you want to go on an extended holiday, or anything. Just fill in the blank. Your need. What is your need? How can you then marry those two things to say, okay, I've got a little bit of flexibility. I'd be willing to start the second half of July. I'll crush it for the first few weeks because that'll get my feet on the ground clinically and I'll have a good sense of what's going on. And then I'll take more time later or I'll negotiate for other things later or I'll just get paid out because the money at that particular time and point is useful. All those things are things that I can't answer for you, but if you can put that into the mix, it really helps you make a good, clear decision. Career things are a little bit different. So for example, if you want to either pursue a fellowship or take advanced training or write a K or uh, those types of things, those are discussions that you need to be having up front if possible. That doesn't necessarily mean you want to take them in year one of your role, but if you can begin to use those to say, I'll do X in year one, but in years two and three, my job is going to be built differently and I will begin to transition into a different type of role structure. Often that's very helpful to the other person sitting across the desk from you, and then you can get a lot of concessions in that particular type of a space or arrangement. I love the idea about taking introspective catalog before going in. Where are my negotiables? How do I know what elements are negotiable for the other party? Well, ask around. That's the first thing. So again, you want to ensure validity, right? The the legitimacy of the negotiator and the negotiation. So asking and hearing that certain people got certain deals is empowering to you because you know that there are deals that can be made. The other thing is just ask the person, is that negotiable? A lot of times, particularly if you're going into an academic job, the starting salary is not negotiable. The hour allocation may or may not be negotiable. And so the rate of pay typically per hour is the non-negotiable factor. So gaining additional protected time for the same base salary is in essence a raise. You're assigning yourself to do other work, hopefully work that you want to do, and that's going to be beneficial to you in the long term. But ultimately, that also gives you some flexibility. So thinking about that as you ask those questions is particularly important. Some places have non-competes, for example. They're built into the contract. They're non-negotiable. 
typically the group president or the chair has already had this argument. It's gone round and round. It's not something that's on the table. The person will typically tell you, I'd love to get that out of your contract, but that's a non-negotiable part of this contract. We're not going to be able to do that. We're a multi-specialty group, and that's got to be in there because otherwise the heart surgeons or X, Y, or Z, you know, those kinds of considerations. So thinking about that, I think, is is important in understanding why that is in there and what type of flexibility they may or may not have on particular things. Other things that may or may not be negotiable in terms of the contract are, for example, the period of time that you might have to work if you decided you wanted to term the contract. A lot of times that's 180 days. Some people will say, well, you know, you need to bring that down to 60 days, two months of time as opposed to six months of time. Those are things that most of the time are not negotiable, but If you find that an issue for you, then it's something that you can talk about. So the main question is ask and ask around. Do you have any advice for kind of reading the room? What kind of nonverbal cues might we look for to know if things are going well or where we can go from there? There's a lot of um, information that you can gain from the individual that you're negotiating with. What's their general posture? How are they sitting in their chair? Are they engaged with you? Are they leaning forward? Are they mirroring your actions? If someone is mirroring your actions, it's going well. They're right in there with you. They're agreeing with you in every way. They're, even their body is agreeing with you. And that's in particularly important to, to notice. If they're leaning back in their chair, they cross their arms, they cross their legs, or if it's a woman, she crosses her ankles, they're less receptive to what you're putting forward. Their body posture is becoming progressively more closed, and they're not liking what they're hearing. If they're sitting back in their chair, and they put their hands behind their head, and they lean back, and their full chest is open to you, that's a complete and total position of power. They feel that they have all the power in that particular moment, and they may or may not be receptive to what you're saying, but it doesn't really matter because they're in charge, right? And they know it. And so all of those things will tell you. If their tone changes, their tone of voice can give you the next biggest bit of information. So listening carefully for tonality of their speech is important. Those are all cues that you know, you can take in to determine whether or not you're on the right track or you're not on the right track. And if you say something or you think that something, again, is not going well, then you can say, I get the impression or it seems to me that what I'm saying isn't isn't hitting on, on a fertile field or it's not being well received. Can you talk to me about that? I mean, what's what what are you hearing that makes this more difficult? Because your job Your number one job in any negotiation is to get as much information as possible out of the other party so that you can make the best deal possible for yourself. And so if they say, wow, when you said you only wanted to start in late September, it's almost a deal breaker for me because I've got an acute staffing crisis that I need to work out now. You just gained a lot of information and potentially a lot of power that you can use. So don't be afraid to ask just to understand. Help me understand what you're thinking now. I'm not really sure that we're on the same page. Comments like that can really get you the type of data that you need to to move forward and move to the next step and get past what could potentially be an impasse or a negotiation derailer. What are some tactics that people use during negotiations? People use all kinds of tactics. One tactic is basically just stonewalling and saying, I don't have the power to do that, or I don't think that's going to be possible. And it may or may not be true, but you definitely need to, again, have that external validation so that you know whether or not it is accurate. One of the tactics that I find very interesting that I see commonly used on women is that really wouldn't be in your best interest. That kind of almost a mansplaining, if you will, of about why that wouldn't be in your best interest. And and that's not only just used by men. The question then becomes, why do you think that? And explain it to me, because in reality, they may be telling you the truth. 
you just don't know it. And it's certainly off-putting when you hear it, because it's like, how would you know what's in my best interest? For example, if someone said, I want to come in and I want to be part-time and I only want to work 50%, And if you said that to me in my office, I'd say, I don't think that's going to be in your best interest. And they might be off put by that. But the answer is, in order for you to get benefits and a benefit profile and have a contribution to your IRA and all those other things, you need to work 0.65. Is there a way that we can figure out that we can get you to 0.65 so that you don't lose those vital years of accrual of your benefits, particularly in your retirement for, you know, the first however many years of your career. So let's figure that out. Those are the kinds of things you need to to sort, and you'll never know unless you ask. And don't ever be afraid to come back and wrap around again and have another conversation and say, hey, you know, when you said this to me, I didn't really think about it at the time, but could you explain what you meant by that? That's perfectly okay. So why do some negotiations fail? What are some common pitfalls that we make in contract negotiation? Number one, not knowing what you want is probably the biggest single pitfall. But negotiations really go off the rails when people start getting emotional about the negotiation. If you visualize what a negotiation should look like, at least in my mind, you've got you know, you on one side, another person on the other side, and an entity in the middle that you're trying to build and create. We're talking about that thing in the middle, right? We're not talking about you. We're not talking about whether or not you have value. We're not talking about whether or not you are worthy. We're not talking about whether somebody likes you or values you. We're talking about this thing. And women tend to think that all of the conversation is some reflection of their personal value, and it's not. It is about the job. And in particular, it goes off the rails often with other women because they think, she doesn't value me. She's not giving me what I want. And reality is, I may not be able to give you what you want. I may be able to give you other things, but you have to help me understand what those other things are so that I can give them to you. The value is in how do we then come together to do this shared work. So when you start getting too emotional and you start focusing on personalities and not issues, then often negotiations go off the rails. The other thing that causes negotiations to go off kilter is if you don't really understand what the other person needs and you focus exclusively on your own needs. Those two things have to, again, be in balance because what you should be thinking about is how am I going to build this relationship with this individual? How is this person going to help me facilitate my career? How am I going to fit into this context? And if I start off on a bad foot with the, quote, boss, even if I get the job, am I going to be positioned for future success? So that's another place where things can go awry. And then if you think about this as a confrontational encounter and wanting to win at all cost, then again, that's not going to go well. Everybody's got a little bit of a give and take in a negotiation for the most part. And so you need to be really thoughtful about what are you willing to give and what would you like to gain from that. And if you have real clarity, that's why that building that list beforehand is so important. If you have real clarity about what you actually need and what you can give now and what matters to you and what doesn't, it needs to be prioritized, right? Because sometimes they need things that you'd be more than happy to give. And that's great. You know, you can just give that right away. It doesn't matter to you at all. That's fine. But you need to get something in return for it. That quid pro quo is really helpful for you to then get what you need out of it. And it may be something that they don't really care about. And you'll never know that unless you have a really engaged conversation and have a true clarity around what it is that you need in order to be successful. You know, you mentioned at the beginning that sometimes people may promise things that they cannot deliver on or they don't have the power to deliver on. How do you know if the person you're talking to does have the power to promise those things? Boy, that's a that's a tough one. You don't necessarily. Unless, again, when you're doing your ask around part of this, 
you have evidence of them giving that in the past, right? So if there's data that that person gave that in the past, then that's a pretty good signal that they could potentially give that again. Once I gave away as part of a negotiation, it wasn't a real giveaway. I got something out of it. But I said to a person, yeah, I'll pay for your master's degree, but I need you to do this bit of work. And I lacked clarity because I was a new chair at that point on the fact that the university was not going to pay for a master's degree outside of the university that we were sitting in, they would be more than happy to waive tuition. And I could have, you know, used departmental funds easily to pay tuition to the existing university, but they weren't going to, you know, go pay tuition for an external school. So that left me with a promise that I couldn't keep because the university didn't offer that particular degree program. So in order to figure that out, I had to basically give this person a stipend that they could use to pay their tuition, but it seemed like to the person that I had broken my promise. I didn't then pay for their master's degree. I just gave them money. Now, from my perspective, that was the best I could do, but somehow this individual wasn't happy with that deal. It was a deal made in naivete on my part. Um, I certainly learned from that. And then when people came and said, next time, can you pay for a master's degree? I would say, I certainly can if the university offers that degree program. So you don't really know if the person can or cannot deliver in all things. But what you have to believe in is that the person is operating in good faith and that they're going to figure a way out to do the very best they can to be true to that promise. Now, Julie and I work at an academic institution, obviously, and we often have residents come and ask us about, hey, this hospital is offering me this contract. Can you help me look through a contract? How do you assess a contract? I think the first thing you need to do is just read it for common sense, right? Read the contract for common sense. Ask the person what parts of this contract are negotiable or any parts of this contract negotiable. Often depending upon the institution, the group, there are not going to be a lot of things in there that are particularly negotiable. But there are definitely some things that you should think about in terms of the contract that you should look at for red flags. And by that, I mean things like non-competes. For the most part, I think you should be able to get your non-competes struck. I used that as an example earlier, but for emergency physicians, non-competes are essentially useless. And so even if you're not able to get it taken out of the contract, the reality is it's probably not going to be enforceable, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be a large pain in order to maneuver through that. So non-competes or particularly restrictive, restrictive covenants. You can't do particular activities. You can't consult. You can't do X, Y, or Z outside of a certain percentage. Most academic institutions will allow their senior faculty physicians or their physicians in general to consult up to about 20% of their total FTE. So you could have technically a 1.0 FTE job in a university and consult for another 20% of a, quote, FTE. Understanding that's going to require an understanding of the faculty handbook, but you need to understand that. The other thing that I think you need to look at carefully are inequitable non-renewal clauses. Are there clauses that allow them to terminate you, get rid of your position, et cetera, without an appropriate appropriate period of warning for you and the ability for you to get another job? Typically, a university setting is going to have about 180 days. That seems a long time. That's six months. But you really need to think about that as not only protective of them, but it's also protective of you. Now, on the flip side of that, the university is almost always going to have this long list of things that they can get rid of you for at the flip of a switch, right? And so you just need to make sure that those things are really clear. They'll say things like unprofessional behavior. Well, 
what is unprofessional behavior and who determines whether or not this behavior is unprofessional. Is there a due process that you would go through? Is there a hospital-based committee or a medical school-based committee that would determine whether or not the behavior was professional or not? So understanding that, I think, are important considerations, particularly in terms of your termination clauses. Intellectual property policies that extend well beyond your desire to assign intellectual property are also important for you to consider. If you're a creative, if you're doing something like you're doing, building a podcast, etc., how does the intellectual property that's associated with that work accrue to you versus accrue to the university? If I write a book, for example, do the proceeds or the royalties from that accrue predominantly to the university or to myself? Again, each individual is going to be different. They're going to have their own needs, but those are things that you need to think about. The other thing that in particular for emergency physicians you need to think about is what is the location or the operation of practice? Is it outside of the range where you are willing to work? If you think that you're signing a contract to work in Des Moines, but they tell you that you're going to have to go to Kansas City, what does that mean? You know, you need to be very clear that they can't just send you anywhere, It particularly if you think that you are going to be working in a particular place. Are there any differences specifically for community hospitals or, you know, community emergency medicine groups? Community uh, hospitals might have differential performance standards, standards that are ambiguous or excessively high. They may include a particular portion of your salary as a portion of your RVUs. So you need to make sure that it's about the work that you did, not the collections that you gained. Those two things are very, very different. And often they read easily, like, you know, take a certain point of collections. So collections drastically different than the amount of work I did to get that 12% collection rate. So you need to be very thoughtful about that. And then again, those non-renewal clauses. If it doesn't work out, can the group just flip a switch and say, it's over, you're out, next week we're done? Because that leaves you in quite a bit of a lurch. And so you need to have some protection for that. And then how do you know when your um, contract renews? Is there an evergreen clause? What happens in terms of your ability to gain partnership? And how do you determine that? What is the criteria for partnership? At what point would you be eligible for partnership? What are the exclusions to partnership? All of those are things that you might want to consider in a private practice or a community-based practice. And when might a physician want to talk to a specialist in contract negotiation? I think if any of those kinds of red flags come up, then it's worthwhile talking to a lawyer about it if you're concerned that the contract is not an equitable contract or a fair contract or a contract that's specific to really the body of work that you're going to be doing as an emergency physician. A lot of academic practices, because they are part of a multidisciplinary practice plan, will have a very basic base contract. And that base contract has been beat to death by a giant team of lawyers and is probably not going to be very flexible. But they all have addendums. And that's where the flexibility can come in in terms of what does the addendum say? How can you codify the conversation that you've had in the addendum such that it realistically represents the deal that you think you've brokered? That's where you'll gain your additional flexibility. A lot of places will do that in terms of an MOU. So, for example, we may in an academic shop have a very basic employment contract And then over that lies a memorandum of understanding or an MOU. And that letter is something that you can go back and forth with your chair and figure it out again till it represents what you think that you both have agreed to and that you're happy with. This has been so enlightening. (laughs) I wish I'd heard this 10 years ago before I entered into practice. Are there any other tips or bits of advice, anything we haven't covered that you want to talk about? I think the most important thing to remember is that you're negotiating with another person. 
again. And if that person is going to be your boss, what you are actually negotiating is the relationship. Is it going to be a long-term relationship? Is it going to be fruitful for you? Is it going to be something that you can use as the beginning of what hopefully is a very satisfying long-term relationship for both of you? So just remembering that, I think, is essential. The other thing I would say that's really important is to remember that it doesn't have to all be done at one particular moment in time, right? Do you know, to say, I hope that this is the first of many conversations and that we have the opportunity to evolve together it is an important caveat and an important close. And if someone offers you something in their office at that particular day, say, thank you very much. Be grateful for that. I really appreciate that. I'm not going to accept that right now because I really want to think about it and figure out how that fits with my long-term strategy and how I think that could work for me overall. But I am grateful for you for offering that. Think about how you would want to be treated in that space and treat the other person in the same way. And that, I think, is ultimately the success key, if you will, for a long-term fruitful relationship and a good negotiation. Pulse check. Preparing to negotiate for a job in emergency medicine can be a complex and sometimes daunting task. However, having a framework to guide your preparation can make the process more manageable and increase your chance of success. Here are some steps to consider when preparing to negotiate for a job in emergency medicine. Research. Remember the negotiation starts at hello. So before you start negotiating, you need to have a good understanding of the position you're applying for, the organization you'll be working for, and the industry standards. Researching the average salary and benefits for your role in your region can help you set realistic expectations. Identify your priorities. Make a list of what you want to achieve from the negotiation, such as salary, benefits, work schedule, and career development opportunities. Determine your BATNA. Knowing your best alternative to a negotiated agreement or BATNA can help you determine your bargaining power. For example, if you have another job offer that may give you more leverage in your negotiation. Be flexible. It's important to have a clear idea of what you want from the negotiation, but it's also important to be open to compromise. Sometimes you may need to adjust your priorities or expectations to reach an agreement that works for both you and the organization. Nonverbal clues can offer a lot of information about the other party's attitude towards the negotiation. Body posture is an important indicator. If someone mirrors your actions, they're engaged and receptive to your proposal. Conversely, if someone crosses their arms or legs or leans back in their chair with their hands behind their head, they are becoming closed off and less receptive. One negotiation tactic is stonewalling. That's where a person claims that they don't have the power to make a decision or that something isn't possible. Another tactic that is commonly said, that's not in your best interest. Start by asking for more information. Clarify what they mean. There may be a way to find a solution or an alternative reason. And the biggest pitfall is not knowing what you want. Negotiations can also go off the rails when people get emotional and focus on personalities instead of the issues. If red flags come up in the contract, it's worthwhile to talk to a lawyer. A basic employment contract is typically inflexible, but additional flexibility can be gained through addendums and memoranda of understanding. All right, I am going to use these at my next meeting, Sarah. Yeah, I'm going to use them tomorrow on my kids. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a wrap for part one of Negotiation in Emergency Medicine. Remember, this was done in collaboration with women in PEM. They are doing important work to support women in our field, and we encourage you to check out their resources and follow them on Twitter. As always, we want to hear from you. What did you think of today's episode? Do you have any tips for negotiating effectively in emergency medicine? Drop us a line on social media at Ian Pulse Podcast and let us know. And thanks to the UC Davis Emergency Department for their support of this project. Thanks to OM Audio Productions for negotiating a fair contract to make this possible. And thanks for listening to Impulse. Until next time, stay dry and keep learning. (laughs) We are all drowning down here in California. (laughs) 